everyone. My name is Erin Hodson, and I'm an extension entomologist with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. And along with Ashley Dean, we've prepared a presentation for Crops TV, the third year, on throwing the kitchen sink at soybean gall midge. Uh, there is a field notes associated with this session, and so I encourage you to access that for a few more resources at the end. My plan for you today is to update you on a few different things that have been happening with soybean gall midge as a brand new pest. So how to identify it, the life cycle and distribution. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work on plant injury yield loss relationships, and so I'll update you on that. Some scouting tips if you're new to soybean gall midge, and then at the end, just provide some current research updates. So let's get started. Uh, this fly is brand new, as I mentioned. Uh, there are about 6,600 different gall midges in the world and about 1,000 in North America. And this photo just shows you a typical midge. Uh, they kind of look like little gnats or little mosquitoes to me. Uh, specifically within the genus of soybean gall midge, there are 56 species around the world and 16 in North America with soybean gall midge being number 16. It was actually Raymond Gagne, who is an alumni of Iowa State, who focuses his whole entire career on midge identification. So he was a person that actually did the species ID for this in 2019. So like all gall midges, they're, they're small, fragile flies with long dangling legs. They have slender bodies, hairy bodies, and hairy wings. So more specifically for soybean gall midge, it's about a quarter inch in length with the females being a little bit bigger. They have long black and white banded legs. So that really stands out to me if you have uh, good enough eyesight to see about two millimeters in length. If you turn it on its side, the soybean gall midge has an orange body with sort of orange and black mottled wings. Now, if you are a person like Raymond who wants to know the difference between soybean gall midge and other midges in this genus, you have to look at the tarsal claws or basically the feet. So, you know, this is way beyond my level of expertise, but if you're wondering how he tells different midges apart, he's looking at their feet and a few other characters. Soybean gall midge has three larval instars. So this is the economic life stage that we care most about because they're feeding on soybean. So I think most people can see the third instar. It's bright orange. It's fairly large, also about a quarter inch in length, and it's fairly mobile. So even though they don't have any types of legs or appendages, they can be pretty wiggly if they're outside of the plant. People do have a harder time seeing first and second instars, not only because they're smaller, but because they're translucent. So as they feed, they, of course, get bigger, but then they take on a bit more color as well. So the life cycle of soybean gall midge is just like any other fly. They have complete metamorphosis with four distinct life stages, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. And I'm fairly confident in saying now compared to the last time I did an update on soybean gall midge is that they have two to three overlapping generations. And so you would find eggs, larvae, pupae, and adults nearly all together all season long. And they do overwinter as a pre-pupa in the, the soil, the top one and a half inches. So there was some data generated by Justin McMechan at the University of Nebraska who took soil cores in a couple of really heavily infested fields. And he diced up those soil cores kind of like a burrito. And he wondered, you know, where are the larvae pre pupae spending their time. And he's, you can tell by this figure here that most of them are in the top one and a half inches. So they're very close to the soil surface, which is good to know for uh, when I talk about some of the management later on. Now the phenology, when I talked about two to three overlapping generations is represented by this graphic. Right now it's December. And again, they're in the fairly close to the soil surface as pre pupae but as the soil temperatures warm up in the spring, particularly in April and May, they're going to resume development where they pupate and then turn into an adult. So uh, our lab and some other labs at Nebraska and Minnesota and South Dakota have spent a lot of time uh, trapping the adults as they're coming out of the ground to better understand the phenology or how they spend their time in the summer. And so we would be looking at cornfields that were infested uh, with soybean gall midge in so as soybean in the previous season. So we're sampling corn. And then as the overwintering flies 
move away from corn, they're looking to infest soybean. And so that's when, if we continue to sample, we would find adults emerging as first and second generation later in the growing season. So this is a more detailed uh, figure prepared by uh, Nebraska in which they were monitoring the overwintering emergence patterns. And so this is last year's soybean, and you can see it's a fairly long period of time from the first midge to the last midge. And you can definitely have peaks around mid-June, which is very similar to what we've seen in Iowa the last three years in which we see uh, midges start to come out in cages uh, that second week of June. So right around June 16th or 17th is when we would start first, first start seeing midges in our last year's soybean fields. Now, if you overlay that with now we're trapping in current year soybean, uh, again, um, we wouldn't typically find adults coming out until late June and early July. And so you have this overlapping multiple generations uh, where you could find soybean gall midge for 30, 60, 90 days in some cases, some fields that are heavily infested. So if you want to know where soybean gall midges are in the entire world, uh, we've now had an estimate of 155 counties in five states. So South Dakota, Minnesota, Nebraska, Iowa, and Missouri. They're not known to occur anywhere else in the world, not Asia or South America or other soybean growing regions. And this is a huge scouting effort supported uh, by a number of, of commodity groups. And so we're thankful for that. But we've done some really detailed scouting uh, over the last couple of years, you can see starting in 2018 up until last year. Uh, in the 2022 growing season, we had 15 new counties confirmed for soybean gallmage, and eight of them were in Iowa. Now, this is this is just presence absence. This does not indicate severity. So in the case of Iowa, I had my lab uh, driving through these counties, and they kind of know the setup for what fields are likely to have soybean gallmage or not. And so we have a van packed with a bunch of kids. They spill out, and within a short amount of time, they can find soybean gallmage, even at low-lying levels. I'd say the counties that were confirmed in 2022 uh, would not be noticed as far as visual in injury symptoms or even yield loss at this point. It's just that we found the presence of soybean gallmage. And so they have the search image uh, for these larvae and infested plants, but it's, it's not at a level that I think a farmer or a crop consultant would know. So um, if you wanna know kind of where you're at, it really depends on the county. We've had about 42 counties now with a positive detection in Iowa. Iowa. And I expect this to slowly spread from this blob that you're seeing in these five states, north and south and east and west. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a few more counties with positive detections in the next decade, extending all the way across Iowa. I did want to spend some time on the potential plant injury caused by this brand new pest and how it relates to injury losses. And so it's important to know um, just through various research projects and just a lot of effort putting into scouting is that we don't typically see plants that are at the cotyledon unifoliate stage, the V1 stage infested with eggs or larvae. It's not until V2 or later that we would see plants that are infested. And we're not sure exactly why this happens. If the uh, females are attracted to fissures or cracks, uh, plant volatiles that are expressed in older plants, but um, that's still to be determined, but we wouldn't start to see larvae until the plants are a little bit older, V2 or later. But after that, you can have a first infestation of a plant all season. So certainly the vegetative stages are quite attractive to the midges laying eggs, but then you can also have first infestations happen very close to seed fill uh, or even pod formation. So in the early parts of the season, um, when you have a plant that's infested and it could die from the larvae, it's not maybe as big a deal because the plants can fill in within rows and between rows as the canopy is, is closing and the plants are getting bigger. What is uh, more hard to see for our farmers when you have plants that have reached seed fill, they get infested with soybean gall midge and then the plant basically dies and is held up by some of the surrounding plants. So what I would recommend for folks is that you scout all season, but you're looking for plants that might be held up by some of the surrounding plants because they're they're basically lodged and um, they can very easily fall down and the grain that is that is still harvestable may be lost because the plants fall to the ground. So 
those areas that are infested later in the season should really be harvested first compared to some of the other parts of the field that maybe were infested early or not infested at all. So uh, my uh, graduate student, Mitchell Helton, what, took the lead on developing this injury yield loss model in which we develop it, developed it after a very successful node injury scale developed for corn rootworm at Iowa State many years ago. So if you're familiar with the zero to three node injury scale, you know that a score for one, say for root injury, is equivalent to about 15% yield loss for corn rootworm. And we wanted to do something similar to provide farmers agronomists and crop consultants, a guide for estimating yield losses on injury. And so this is visual symptoms or percent wilting on a zero to four scale. So you can see here, if you have a score of a one, you have at least 25% of the plants with visual symptoms. Score of a two is 50. And um, the max level that you could have, of course, would be 100% or a score of four. This is all the detail, the data points that went into generating this yield loss model. We had a range of injury and then a range of yield potential. And of course, as you have more injury, the yield potential decreases. And so this is sort of a busy way to think about injury and yield loss. And so that's why we converted this over to a zero to four to make it more palatable for an applied audience. And so if you're familiar at all with some of the disease uh, progress curves that can happen, it's, it's sort of the similar process. It's a cumulative uh, form of severity under the progress curve, in other words. And so uh, we have a zero to 6,000 under the progress curve, but again, we've converted it to a zero to four uh, injury scale. And again, it does measure season long exposure, but it does help us provide some key talking points on predicting yield loss. And so uh, we're still tweaking this model. There's a lot of factors that need to go into how soybean gallmage can impact yield, but so far it's been a pretty predictable uh, scale in which that zero to four directly translates into some of the yield loss predictions we're seeing on small plot and commercial fields. So this is an example of what Mitchell had for visual scores on that zero to four. Again, a score of a one would be at least 25% impacted plants up to a four, which would be up uh, close to 100%. So depending on the timing of infestation and the severity, if you do have plant loss, especially later in the season, Unfortunately, you can get a lot of weeds that come in and take up that empty space. And so weed control has been a particularly frustrating issue for those farmers who are impacted by soybean gallmage because they have these really large weeds that form at the end of the season um, when a lot of farmers have uh, stopped with their herbicide program. And so they end up with the following growing seasons, a lot of heavy weed pressure. Uh, this is just another way to look at uh, the uh, sort of that injury to yield loss relationship uh, with a postdoc at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, in which again we have on the left you have the severity curve, and then um, we've related it to distance from the edge. And you can see here on zero to 500 feet from the edge, you can still have soybean gall midges. Uh, yeah as far as like having more uh, midges on the field interior, but most of the injury is going to be concentrated on the first 50 feet or 100 feet from the field edge. So it's definitely a pest where the edges of the field are, will be impacted more by severity, and that directly translates to yield. So you see the figure on the right, sort of the opposite curve in which uh, zero to 100 feet from the edge, you could observe quite a bit of yield loss because either plants are impacted or they could be straight up killed by larval feeding. And so I wanted to also provide some scouting tips. And so I'll go over some what I consider good visual cues for vegetative and reproductive plants. But then I'm also going to be showing just a short video that I took this summer to kind of uh, remind you of some visual cues for scouting. So, but first we'll start off. And as a, as a most important thing you can do is if you don't know if you have soybean gall midge or you weren't sure, um, is to start on field edges that were infested last year. And so remember, they're highly aggregated to field edges. And so focusing your sampling efforts on the first eight rows is really important. If you're not finding midges at the edges, you're very unlikely to see them in the field interior. 
Uh, we'd want to start at V2 or later. In Iowa especially, we, not, we aren't seeing midges in fields until mid-June. So if you happen to be on, on the leading edge of infested counties, you may even want to first start in July or maybe even early August. And then scout weekly because injury can happen very quickly after initial infestations. Uh, if you want uh, to improve your accuracy, you want to spend time focusing on the stems just above the soil line. This is where larvae particularly like to feed is in the top six inches right above the soil. And so initially it's hard because the stems can appear swollen or corky, cracked, um, and that is where the, the gall of the soybean gall midge, a common name, is formed because it's a plant's response to try and work or, uh, or defend itself against that feeding. But over time, depending on how many larvae are inside the stem, it can appear uh, like a black lesion starts to form right above the base. And so I have a couple examples here where that lesion is forming and you can actually start to see some of the larvae that are feeding on the inside of the stem get exposed to the outside. And then just the biology of those instars is that those third instars, the, the bright mobile orange ones, are gonna work their way outside of the plant and flick themselves onto the ground because they pupate in the soil. So sometimes uh, you'd be able to see larvae right on the outside of the plant as well. So some scouting tips. Um, I wouldn't even try to scout for adults. They're very uh, unlikely to see in the field, even if you're using sweep nets. Don't even get me started about sticky cards. Um, don't waste your time looking for an adult. Uh, what you do want to spend time on is looking for larvae that are feeding inside of the plant, remember right near the base. Uh, a good knife is something that you want to have because you want to use a knife and split stem so that you're able to catch sort of the early, the first and second instars before some of those visible lesions start to appear. So it's also a great way to distinguish soybean gall midge from other things like uh, pathogens that might be in the field. So initially in, the, in soybean fields, if you're looking at small plots or commercial fields, you're going to see small pockets of stressed plants, especially near the edge. So they could be wilted, they could be stunted, they can just be off color, um, or they could be girdled in which you have a stem that looks either pinched. It could be also the other way where it looks swollen or gall-like just above the soil line. And so this is a, something that we've seen in areas that are, have been heavily infested is that you have a pocket of dead or dying plants that can expand very quickly. If you notice the photo on the left, it is directly adjacent to a cornfield. That field of corn was soybean that was infested last year. And so again, as adults come up into corn, uh, the following growing season, they're gonna move and they don't have to move very far in this case to find soybean to lay their eggs. Uh, the photo on the right, you have an area that's separated by a grassy uh, area. This is also really common. It could be a tree line, some sort of fence, waterway. It could even be a physical road that separates the field. Um, they are able to travel small distances. And so you'll see a mixture of dead and dying plants maybe mixed in with healthy plants. So as I mentioned, uh, some people who are new to scouting or confirming soybean gallmage uh, would mistake things like brown stem rot or could mistake. And so this is really common to see is that some people bring in samples and they're actually pathogens and not soybean gallmage. So you'd wanna be able to distinguish especially early season diseases from soybean gallmage. So it's not to say that you, you couldn't have some of these diseases happening at the same time as soybean gallmage, certainly you could. Um, if you have hail damage at any point in the season, sometimes diseases can um, really thrive in that uh, injured tissue. And also soybean gallmages tend to do very well in stems that have been injured by hail. So you could have multiple things happening at the same time, but to be able to split the stock and distinguish pathogens from hail injury from soybean gallmage is really important. So later in the season when plants enter the reproductive stage, I think it is more difficult to confirm soybean gallmage. And that's just because plants are bigger, the canopy closes, and the area that we wanna focus on is near the soil. And so we want to look for lodged or dead plants. Remember, they could be near seed set and, and then first infested, and you have plants that become pretty brittle and break off at the base, but they're supported by some of the surrounding plants. And um, if you had a heavy infestation 
in the early vegetative stage. You have adults coming out from there. They're going to look for fresh, healthy plants to lay eggs. So this is a point in the season which you might find infestations more in the field interior. And again, you could have uh, plants that um, aren't alive anymore. You have big pockets of dead plants that are replaced by weeds. Sometimes those pockets could be mistaken for spider mite injury and drought stress years, or it could uh, visually look like soybean death syndrome. So you'd want to take a look and figure out if it's midges or maybe something else. When I go into a field, again, in the reproductive stages, I have to part the canopy and look at the base. It could be brittle, swollen black lesions, but oftentimes that tissue right above the soil line is very brittle. And so if you push on the stem, kind of like you do the push test in corn, although it's not quite as dramatic, you're gonna hear little cracks or pops. And that is a, a tissue that's just been eaten away and is no longer supporting. It's no longer bringing nutrients and water to the top of the plant. And that's where you get some of the very quick wilting and plant uh, death in some cases. And so uh, I want to transition now to just a, a quick three minute video that I took this summer where I give some scouting tips and just basically a recap of what I just talked about. So let's watch the video. Hi everyone, my name is Erin Hodson and I'm an extension entomologist with Iowa State University. I'm here at FEEL, which is a demonstration lab right west of Ames, Iowa, and it's August 18th, 2022. I wanted to give you some ideas about how to scout for soybean gall midge. It's a brand new field crop pest here in Iowa, so if you've never seen it before or don't know where to start, I wanted to provide some tips for looking for this brand new pest. So, okay, so let's go. Now, as the common name suggests, Soybean gall midge is a small fly that infests soybean. So of course the first place you'd want to look is in a soybean field. If you aren't sure if you have it or not, I really recommend scouting the first eight to ten rows of soybean near field edges. If it's not there, you're not likely to find it in the field interior. They usually show up at the edge first. And if I had a corner or an edge to pick, I definitely want to pick rows that are adjacent to corn. Or maybe more specifically, I want to scout along a field edge that was soybean the previous growing season. The midges don't move very far. They have pretty local movement between growing seasons. And so scouting in these first couple of rows uh, next to where soybean was planted the previous year is where I'd start. For the past couple years, the first adult emergence from the overwintering generation uh, starts to be detected around the middle of June. Shortly after that, we would be able to find infested plants. So if you're wondering when to start scouting, the very earliest that you'd start scouting likely would be the end of June or the beginning of July. Now when they're in the vegetative stage, it's a bit easier because plants are smaller. You're going to notice that there's going to be kind of a rapid wilting of a plant that's infested, maybe stunting or even plant death as the infestation continues. And so when the plants are small, of course, you can just walk along the rows and look for plants that don't look so good. However, later in the season, like it is in August right now, it is more difficult to see if plants are infested or not. So once the canopy closes, you're going to have to open up that canopy and look for plants that are stressed. So they could be, again, stunted, wilted, or even dead and kind of held up by some of the surrounding plants. Now, to confirm whether or not you have soybean gall midge versus something else takes a closer look. So what I do is I part the canopy and I look at the base of the plants. Infested plants are, always have larvae that are actively feeding near the base, right above the soil line, about four to six inches. I encourage you to pull up plants. Look at the area just right above the soil line. And if it looks discolored, maybe it looks swollen, lots of cracking, fissures, then it's worth taking a closer look. And oftentimes the area right above the soil line is very brittle and breaks off. So use a knife to peel back that first layer and look for larvae. There could be anywhere from five to over a hundred larvae feeding on this plant. So imagine when there's lots of larvae, it can straight up kill plants, but it doesn't take very many larvae to weaken the stem. Okay, we're back. I hope that quick video was a good visual cue for you to learn where and when to start scouting for soybean gall midge, especially if you're thinking about doing this in 2023 and beyond. 
Now, some people have access to aerial technology in which there are scouting fields for other things, say fertility, plant stand, other things, or just because they have a cool new toy. And this is sometimes when people find out that they have problems with soybean gallmage. Maybe a storm came through and they're looking for injury, green snap, other things that are happening on the farm. And they see these large swaths or passes of dead plants on soybean right at those field edges. So these are a couple of r really extreme examples, one in Iowa and one in Nebraska, where you have uh, a measurable amount of plant lost right at the edge. So the picture on the left is from a field in Western Iowa in which it's not exactly square fields, but um, this farmer noticed that they had quite a bit of plant loss. Not sure at this time, remember it's 2008, if it was caused by deer or some other things and taking a closer look into the field very quickly confirmed it was soybean gall mitch. But you can see how concentrated the plant losses right at that field edge contrast with that corn and soybean, which uh, that corn was planted to soybean the previous year. And then it sort of disperses or tapers off as you go into the field interior. The photo on the right is taken in 2020, a little bit more recently. Um, and you can see though, it's separated by a road and the midges just moved across the road and infested those uh, rows that are very close to the edge. And you can see there's still some plants alive, but there's also quite a bit of weeds that have entered those areas with um, big gaps. And so this is something that I don't want to happen um, for folks, but unfortunately this has been a trend in especially Eastern Nebraska and West Western Iowa, in which you have that measurable loss, uh, 50 to sometimes 100 feet from the field edge. Okay, I titled my presentation a kitchen sink approach, and um, this is a pest that's been particularly interesting from an entomology perspective, but very, very frustrating from a farmer's perspective because we don't have one or two really quick and easy tools like we have for many other pests. And so it's been this huge research effort by many labs in the North Central region looking at different IPM tactics. And so I just wanted to provide sort of these quick updates on what we're doing for genetic, cultural, mechanical, biological, and chemical tools. Okay, so why is it so difficult? Um, why can't we get a handle on this pest? And it's really because of the biology and the nature of how it's feeding. We have small, non-feeding adults, so they're not taking in any of the product that we might be spraying if you have contact or ingestion. Uh, they have a very long emergence period from the first smidge to the last smidge. And then remember we have two or three overlapping generations. So there's constant production of egg laying, constant uh, feeding from larvae at different stages for again, early vegetative through seed set. So it's a very long time to be feeding. And then just the larvae are not accessible to some of the most common foliar or rescue treatments that we have because they're contact insecticides. So all this comes together as really significant challenges to yield protection. So I'll be talking about some of the projects that I think are most promising or will be most promising in the future. The first uh, update that I'll provide, which I'm really excited about, is the evaluation of tolerant genetics. And I did have experience with this when I was evaluating host plant resistance genes for soybean aphid about 10 years ago. And we're going through the same process here for soybean gallmage. Uh, labs at Nebraska and South Dakota and Iowa have been looking at this very large germplasm screen from a library at the University of Nebraska in which we have a breeder that's providing a wide range of soybean genetics from all over the world. And we're screening them to see if there's any tolerance or host plant resistance mechanisms. And we've been refining. We started out with thousands of lines and very small plots, just a handful of seeds. And we are trimming down those lines in which we looked at 72 in 2022. Uh, we visited these small plots uh, throughout the season looking for the presence or absence of larvae. We used the zero to four injury score that I talked about just a few minutes ago. And then because the plots are a little bit larger with these accession lines, we've been actually able to uh, take in yield components as well. And so the data is not in from 2022 yet, but the soybean breeder assured us that the winners 
usually the top to 10 to 15 percent, uh, the best genetics will move on to a 2023 screening. We'll get larger plots. We'll be able to do um, uh, evaluations for more modern genetics. And hopefully that's something that industry will be interested in incorporating into some of the other breeding programs that farmers want for drought tolerance and other characteristics. So I'm very excited about host plant resistance or tolerant genetics. It's just uh, because it's a naturally uh, occurring germ germplasm or breeding program, it just takes about 10 years to make it happen. I get a lot of questions about cultural control. So things that are in the hands of farmers, planting date, row spacing, populations, uh, other things. And I have a really good example from a graduate student at Nebraska, Natasha, which I'm on her, uh, her graduate committee. And one of the things she was looking at was planting date. We get a lot of questions about, can planting date help or hurt soybean gallmage? So this is an example from 2022 in which she had five different planting dates and then looked at the injury score at the end of the season. And it's not on the zero to four, it's on the severity curve, but I think you get the idea that it looks like those last two planting dates had less injury. And remember, it directly translates to yield protection when you have less injury. And so how does that translate to yield? Well, uh, we did have higher yield, but then you can expect that for other agronomic reasons, those um, those uh, fields that are planted later eventually don't reach uh, maximum yield potential. And so you're kind of balancing uh, the injury that could be caused by soybean gallmage and the yield potential by planting very late. Although we have noticed uh, some farmers who are very frustrated by soybean gallmage, they do tend to plant on the later end of the season. They're not the first soybean fields in on the, the county or the farm that they tend to plant a little bit later in order to preserve the yield potential that might happen from um, just avoiding that attractiveness of that, of that first infestation from overwintering adults. So I think that planting date can make a difference. It's going to be a balancing act um, with some of the other agronomic features. I get a lot of questions about tillage and can that impact overwintering success. So if you remember, uh, soybean gallmage spend the winter in the top one and a half inches of the soil. And it's been shown for some other pests that we can use tillage as a mechanical or physical crushing of those pests so that they physically don't survive, or you bring them up to the soil surface and they desiccate, or they're just exposed to some of the brutal temperatures that we might experience in the winter. And so um, could uh, more aggregated or site-specific tillage actually provide an impact for overwintering success? I have an example here from a graduate student at Iowa State, Ben Colby, who looked at a commercial farm in western Iowa near Wall Lake this summer. And he had four different tillage timings. He had a fall tillage, a spring tillage, fall plus spring, and then some untreated or no-till plots. And we're going uh, using the expertise from our corn rootworm entomologists, and we're using these Illinois-style traps in which we put them over the soil, uh, and the adults that come out of the soil will be collected in the little canning jars you see at the top. So more specifically, uh, he used two different tillage implements, including a disc and a chisel, and you can kind of see how far in the soil they're definitely interacting with the majority of soybean gall midges if they were in that field. And the results here, I think, are really too soon to tell. Unfortunately, uh, I can't tell you, you know, how many people hours went into this project as far as not only the tillage, but the trapping that went along with this, thousands and thousands of hours probably. He only recovered 19 adults. So this is the unfortunate part about using those rootworm cages is that um, you recover very few, even though um, just because it, it only collects adults from a very small footprint or area of the uh, tillage plots. And so we have very low numbers represented in the in this results here to the right. And although it looks like there's some differences, if you look at the scale of mean adults being captured, you know, it's 0.1. It's not even a quarter of a midge. So very, very low numbers. Um, but there were some treatment differences in which basically there was more adults captured from those areas that were tilled 
versus no-tilled. And so this is sort of the opposite than what I would think, is that um, we would use tillage to disrupt the success, but actually it appeared that they had more success coming out of the tillage areas. But on the other hand, the numbers are so low, I'm not sure it's an actual representation of what's going on in the field. So it is an area that we continue to look at, not only at Iowa, but other places. Uh, Nebraska and South uh, Nebraska and Minnesota are looking at uh, causing uh, or using mowing to minimize the resting or niche areas that you might have between fields. It's been shown for other pests like European corn borer that they don't move a lot during the peak of the day and they seek refuge in cooler areas where they have kind of grassy borders. And then at dawn and dusk, they go out, mate, and lay eggs. And so we are wondering if that could be an approach to minimize sort of the suitable resting areas for midges during the day. And the results are also inconclusive, um, but continuing to look at that, just we don't know exactly where the midges spend their time. Uh, we don't think they live very long, so they have to be resting somewhere and mowing the areas around field edges might be an approach that we could use as well as far as a, a cultural control. Uh, also, some really exciting work on creating physical barriers so that the females can't lay the eggs in the stem. Remember, they like to uh, deposit eggs right above the soil line, usually zero to four or zero to six inches right above. And so what happens if we could create a physical barrier with the soil so that they couldn't actually get those eggs into the stem? And so Nebraska has been particularly energized and done quite a bit of work using hilling to kind of, uh, as, as a cultivator, to fluff up the soil uh, right along those early V2 plants. And so this is uh, actually difficult to do is to have a cultivator when plants are so small. And we've had a lot of good experience with learning to drive straight and slow and not actually kill the plants, but uh, do uh, kind of bring some soil up right at the edge. So you can see the hilled versus the no-hilled on the right. And can that provide a barrier? So we have this uh, data set for a couple years now at the Nebraska, and then um, we started the same thing here at Iowa State last year, and it is dramatic. It, um, you can see the hilled versus the non-hilled areas where um, the hilling occurred early in the season, right when we would expect those plants to be susceptible to egg laying. And you can see the plots that were not hilled Basically, all of them died. And those plants that were healed or had a little bit of physical protection um, were able to survive. So this appears to be a very dramatic and effective way to cause a physical barrier. Although I think uh, those folks at Nebraska and myself would say that they're protected during that overwintering movement from corn to soybean. But when those midges come out of the non-hilled areas, they're looking for fresh plants and they're going to uh, have access to those uh, plants that were um, not infested during the first round and could be uh, very susceptible to that next round, so the first and second generation. And so it is a strategy in which we're still, still trying to work out the kinks because we initially were thinking we would just uh, cause that physical barrier or have that aggregated site-specific tillage along the edge. But then we know that midges can move, so they'll just move to the field interior. Or first and second generation midges will kind of like double down and attack those clean plants. And so it's also sort of a temporary physical barrier because if you have rain or anything where the soil settles, um, the stem becomes accessible to eggs or to females that are laying eggs in plants. So still trying to work this out, but we know that we can create a physical barrier and females just aren't able to lay eggs in those areas. So also very exciting project. I get some people asking me about natural enemies for soybean gall midge. And then we have, you know, just a lot of generalist predators, pathogens, and parasitoids that they're very happy to attack anything that they can get a hold of. Uh, but there's been a specific project at the University of Minnesota with Bob Cook in which he was able to recover some infested larvae or some 
some soybean gall midge larvae that were infested by a parasitoid. And so you can see here in this top picture, a little tiny stingless wasp that was recovered from a larva. It's just a little bit smaller than the larva itself. And um, it is an unknown species. And so that's very interesting and fantastic from a research perspective is to discover a new species. But he also found a few other parasitic wasps, more generalists that would infest the larva. So I think about a stingless wasp that's pretty small. She has to locate a plant that's infested with larvae, and then she injects an egg through the stem into the larvae, which is just really fantastic. And so there's so much to learn about this biology. How do they find infested plants? How do they know uh, where to go in the winter to overwinter? We don't know if they're inside the larvae or somewhere else. So a lot to learn about the biology of these parasitoid wasps. Bob is also doing uh, just general surveys on ground beetles that would be considered generalist. They're running along the soil surface and they're going to basically eat anything that they can get a hold of. You see a picture here on the bottom, this uh, ground beetle that has a midge larvae in its mouth. And so they're doing all these pitfall studies. They're dissecting the stomachs of these ground beetles and finding midge larvae parts in their stomachs. And so this is another ongoing uh, area of research. I think that natural enemies can provide some suppression for soybean gall midge larvae, um, but I'm not sure to the extent that they would provide complete uh, control or minimizing or eliminating a population. But I think uh, every little bit helps as far as the kitchen sink approach. So yes, they're out there. And then the last strategy, which is usually our go-to first response silver bullet for field crop pests is insecticides. And um, I, I don't know how else to say other than we have tried every single strategy that is legally available and sometimes off-label just to see if it works. Um, and Nebraska has two. We're looking at insecticidal seed treatments and sometimes some very high, extremely high active ingredient rates. We're looking at at plant liquids, granulars that are typically used in a corn rootworm system. So you um, direct the product in the furrow or over the top um, as you're planting. We've also looked at a wide variety of insecticide groups as foliar sprays to not only attack the adults, but hopefully make an impact for the larvae as well. And we've looked at different timings, different mixtures, and uh, a wide variety of application products. And then using some drop nozzle technology in which we're directing the spray to the base of the plants. Um, I've had some uh, really variable pressures for soybean gall midge at some of the sites that I have set up small plots. And so I have not seen a consistent response from anything that I've been doing, unfortunately, no matter the, the mode of action, the timing, the application site, I have never seen any type of a consistent response. Nebraska has had a little bit more, they've had a bit more luck with some of the in furrow applications of, of insecticides, but it generally protects the vegetative soybeans and those healthy plants that enter the reproductive stage that were protected in the vegetative stage are very attractive to those midges that are laying eggs later in the season. So it's not a season long protection. It's more um, focused on the early season or overwintering movement. So unfortunately, I don't recommend uh, insecticides as an uh, option for soybean gall midge at this time because we don't have products that can target the larvae. They're not accessible because of where they're feeding inside the stem. And most of the products that we have would be through contact or ingestion. So this is an area that I particularly spend a lot of time on, and there's always new products. There's new modes of action. Uh, there's new group numbers and new active ingredients that I'm always looking at. And so I'll continue this area of research, but for now, there's nothing that I can uh, confidently recommend that you would even break even. And so some of the other cultural or mechanical strategies that I talked about um, have proven a little bit more consistent, but insecticides, unfortunately, is um, not something that's in the kitchen sink uh, for my recommendations at this time. So uh, we have some management strategies that I'd just like to summarize, and which uh, if you are in an area with persistent uh, infestations, you're noticing measurable yield loss, especially at the edge, some of the things that I could recommend for you is to 
delay the planting to reduce the severity. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to plant in June, but you don't wanna be those first fields planted in April or early May, because I think that those fields tend to have more injury and yield loss associated with that. If you have the ability to hill or cultivate, that might be also provide a physical barrier for early vegetative and it might help you avoid some of the, the, the hardest hitting midges that are infesting early in the season, but no, that is not going to be a season long deterrent. I think we do have biological control out there. So if you were to ever see something where the midges don't look quite right, maybe they look puffy, they look off color, they look like a powdered donut, that's very exciting from my perspective to know that there's biological control contributing to some of the suppression. I don't, I don't think it'll be the only tactic that we can rely on. Insecticides have proven um, not consistent, and I'm not sure people are getting a break even from the input costs um, so far for insecticides. And those areas that are infected or infested, particularly later in the season, I would recommend harvesting first. So whether it's the edge or a part of the field that got infested and you have plants that are kind of standing up and held up by some of the surrounding plants, you can still recover that grain if you harvest maybe on the early side compared to maybe the field interior or other parts of the field or other parts of the farm that aren't infested. So target those areas first to recover the grain. I do think that genetics is going to be the long-term approach and sort of the standard that we could put in into every field. And so maybe some of these other management tactics I talked about today could contribute to that, but it's going to be a longer process to get tolerant genetics into currently um, uh, modern uh, soybean products that farmers have access to. So in just a, a more general summary, I think that the geographic range is expanding for soybean gall midge. We have 155 counties. It represents a very large soybean production region of the United States with potential for, um, it's a huge production value that we want to protect. And just because of some of the, the biology of this pest and the nature of where it's feeding, it poses significant challenges to crop protection or the management. So there's still a lot of, so many questions about why some fields get infested, why some don't, why, why some seem particularly attractive and others are left alone, even though they may be across from the road from each other or even on the same farm. We don't have a good understanding of why some just seem particularly attractive to those females. So we're still learning about that. Um, we do have some best management practices that need some tweaking. They're still in the works, and I will continue to provide sort of the kitchen sink approach uh, recommendations for farmers, crop consultants, and agronomists. But for now, um, it's a lot of information coming in through different research projects, in, particularly in, North, in uh, Nebraska and Minnesota and Iowa. So more to come. I did want to bring up a, a brand new feature through Iowa State called the Midwest Pest Alert Network. So Ashley and I have put together this page. I just have a screenshot on the right in which um, you can sign up free. Free text messages uh, are pushed to you. Um, just we realized email, newsletters, and providing some updates on websites might not be the easiest thing for people who are outside all day, every day in the field. But um, if text messages are a way to get you information, I think the alert network might be for you. Ashley and I put out one to two text messages a week based on your preferences. So you could have a geography, say you want to be uh, only getting notifications for Western Iowa, or you can get statewide. We also can narrow it down to a few specific pests if you're interested. And so um, we provide information on pest identification, scouting tips. Um, we also have a few key pests that we're working with with the Iowa Mesonet that build degree day accumulation maps because every season's a little bit different. And so if alfalfa weevil happens to be the main pest of concern or Japanese beetle, we have these real time degree day maps that can help refine your scouting efforts so that you only are scouting when you think you need to because from north to south and east to west, the accumulating degree days can be quite different from year to year. So I encourage you to sign up for the Pest Alert Network if you're interested in learning more about some of these features. So as I mentioned, soybean gall midge is a huge economic concern when it can outright kill plants or cause significant yield losses 
in that five state region. And we've gotten a lot of support from our universities, from commodity groups, uh, other federal funding sources, and then of course, industry. And so I wanted to uh, throw out a big thank you for that. Um, this is going to be a long-term effort and we really appreciate all the support and the sponsors to help train graduate students and learn more about the crop protection for this brand new pest. So I wanna thank you, uh, Ashley and I are on Twitter. We appreciate feedback that you might be seeing, not only for soybean gallmage, but for anything else, particularly in Iowa. And then just one more plug for field notes. Um, I think you'll find some additional resources in there. And then uh, particularly the Soybean Gallmage Regional website, where we have some events coming up this winter for regional webinars and some other things. So I really appreciate you joining the session of Crops TV and good luck in the summer. Thank you. Mm -hmm.